This card is insane. Its core ability lets you gain life every time any artifact goes to the graveyard, and having multiple Marauders on the field can lead to gaining an astonishing amount of life in just a matter of seconds. We rely on cards like Chromatic Star, Chromatic Sphere, and Candy Trail as our primary tools for filtering our draws and managing our mana. We have cards like Ancient Steerings, Expedition Map, and Crop Rotation to ensure that we consistently have access to the 3 drawn combo pieces as quickly as possible to ramp into powerful creatures such as Boulder Branch Golem, Olamox Crusher and Fangry Marauder itself. In a deck that certainly has a very explosive start but can it go toe to toe against the top decks of the meta? Let's find out. In our very first match, we were lucky to have a natural Tron in hand, ready to play a Boulder Branch Golem on turn 3. This seemed like a fantastic start that could win most games. However, the current pace of Pauper matches is much faster than it used to be. If our opponents manage to chain Cooldota Reverts and Golden Bushwhackers, we could be in trouble. Despite this, we were able to play a sturdy creature and gain some life, which helped us stabilize our position on the board. Then, our opponent revealed a Sweet Spear from a Synthesizer and decided to deal some damage by attacking. After the dust settled, it was our turn again, and I opted to use Ancient Steerings first. I wanted to find a cantip artifact to play alongside my Marauder on the next turn. For now, all I like to do now is play a self assembler and pass. On their turn, they revealed a land and two Golden Bushwalkers in a row with reckless impulse. This is when I decided to play an Oglemox Crusher instead of the Marauder. I thought having a powerful finisher on the field would put pressure on them to act quickly. So we did just that and passed the turn. To my surprise, they had a third bushwalker and played it alongside the other two, launching a massive attack that brought us down to 10 life, but this is where the Fangreen Marauder proved its worth. By cracking a couple of eggs, I was able to regain the life I lost and more, going from 10 life to 28 in a single turn of events. Furthermore, they had to pay the Crusher's ability cost, so we were in a relatively safe position. They used a synthesizer that revealed a second revert. However, thanks to my Marauder's ability, I was able to gain life yet again. And even more when they cracked the synthesizer to create another creature. Now, sitting at 43 life, we kept the momentum going by adding a second Marauder to the field, cracking the map to find another land, and playing another self-assembler before going into combat. Of course, we also attacked, forcing them to sacrifice more permanents to pay the Crusher's tax. They soon considered the game. After sideboarding, an additional bread weapon and a couple of turn timber aesthetics can help us stabilize while we set up our combo. We were off to a great start, however, our opponent had other plans for us as they cast a smash to smithereens, falling our strategy. For now, all we could do was to play a chromatic star and pass the turn. They launched an attack and added a Kessic fire breeder, while we simply play a land and pass the turn again. Our best move at this point was to use Bread Weapon and pseudo clear the board in case they play a Kudot Revert. As they revealed it from a synthesizer, we successfully mitigated some damage. Still, we found ourselves in the same predicament as before, with another turn passing without us playing anything relevant to the board. The good news was that our opponents were running down on resources as well, and it would take a while for them to rebuild, or at least that's what I thought, until 5 more creatures suddenly hit the board in just one turn. Block was on our side as we top deck a forest, enabling us to play a solid blocker and gain life in the process. They launch an attack with almost everything and I block the biggest threat. On my turn I had no other option but to play a golem, gain life and hope they didn't draw a bushwhacker. Thankfully they passed the turn and I decided to go on the offensive as I needed to close the gap somehow. They opted to take the damage. After combat I could slam a Marauder and hope for the best. On their turn, a Swiss Spirit and an Impulse, and a Sticker Goblin joined the party, but refused to attack. This gave me the chance to find a map, get the missing Trumpies, and add another blocker to the field. Things got tricky as a Rain Resolve revealed a Synthesizer and a Cool Daughter Revert. However, the silver lining was that to play the Revert, they need to crack an artifact, which meant we could gain more life. Another Reckless Impulse hit the board, and at this point, the threat of a Bushwhacker was becoming even more real. They attack and I chomp block with my golem to gain life when it died, return it with Pulse of Morasa and gain life again. The cycle continued and our total life continued to rise, reaching 42 in a single turn. On theirs, they play more cards, dealing some damage to us but ultimately we ended up gaining life thanks to the Marauder's trigger and we were back to square one. 
This was when I saw the opportunity to start attacking with my creatures. If they kill any of them, it will help boost my life total. After combat, I added another formidable creature to the board, and after the draw, they were unable to find a bushwhacker and conceded. In our next match, our initial hand wasn't bad, but we decided to take advantage of the London Mulligan rule and give it a spin, hoping to find a near perfect drawn hand. The new hand looked promising, with a map and two throne pieces already in the place, so we decided to keep it. When facing blue decks, we needed to be cautious of counter spells and aim to bait them to resolve our more significant threats. We successfully assembled our throne on turn 3, but we encountered a force of spike when trying to cast our golem, so we had no choice but to pass the turn. Our opponent played a land with none for the place, allowing us to fill the board with our cantrip artifacts and pass the turn. These travel scenarios are quite common against blue decks and the key to winning is patience, waiting for them to tap out or not to have enough counters to handle multiple threats in a turn. At this point, we had 10 mana at our disposal, so we were close to casting both of our creatures back to back. Our opponent finally played a Cryptic Serpent while keeping counter my up. We proceeded with our plan and a Norse's power plant made it possible. I made a slightly mistake by casting the end instead of the Marauder, resulting in the first one being countered. Ideally, we would have preferred it the other way around. Regardless, we had something that we could trade with the creature. At least that was the plan until they bounced it. Nevertheless, we replayed our creature this turn and regained the life with lost by cracking the chromatic star. Moreover, a pulse of Murasa would prove useful in this match, but for now it made more sense to efficiently use her mana by slamming a second marauder. Our opponent used a snap once again to bounce one of our blockers, but we were happy with trading for theirs. Anula Mox Crusher joined our ranks. Nope. It did not, but at least we had the Pulse of Murasa ready to return one of our big creatures to our hand. Upon realizing this, my opponent conceded. It seemed I had forgotten to cyborg, but ideally, I would have added 4 Pyroblasts, reduced the number of bed weapons in the main deck, and include some Pulse of Murasa for the longer matches. However, this is just a rough plan, and I will appreciate your opinion of the best approach in the comments. We opened with an excellent hand featuring a natural throne on turn 3, with one small problem, no color mana. Nevertheless, it was too good to pass up, so we keep it. We played the Drago game until turn 5 when our opponent decided to play a Murmuring Mystic without any counter backup and pass the turn. I seized the opportunity to find another land and slam a little more Crusher on the table, hoping they didn't have a snap to get rid of it. Fortunately, they didn't, and they ended up conceding the match. If you are enjoying this content, please consider liking the video. In our last match, we faced Azoris Affinity, a deck known for relying on all that glitters and explosive starts to steal games. Starting hand was decent, and we decided to utilize the turn 1 chromatic star into ancient steerings to locate the missing throne pieces. They played some creatures and pass, and from the star trigger I drew a tower. However, they were also building up solid threats in the form of mere enforcers. Fortunately, they weren't as large as our golems, and as long as they didn't draw an all that glitters, we should be fine. In response, my opponent mostly just drew cards and passed their turn. On my end, I tried to sneak in a Lunla Monk's Crusher, but as expected, it was met by a counter. I faced some mosquito attacks in the process and on my turn, I decided to attempt to resolve the second Crusher and set up the field to play a Fangrin Marauder on my next turn. This would force them to sacrifice some artifacts, triggering my Marauder's ability. I executed the plan and they took a significant hit, going from 20 to 6 life points in a single turn. This was likely their last chance to draw an all the glitters, but they failed to find it, so they decided to move on to game number 2. I contemplated where for the glamour will be enough and considering adding some pyroglass. Your thoughts on this will be appreciated in the comments. This hand looked ok, and I decided to keep it since I had the glamour. After drawing a power plant, things seemed promising, however they sneaked in a ninja that allowed them to dig deeper into their library. Nevertheless, the damage was minimal, so we proceeded to search for a last trump piece and pass the turn. They attack once more, bringing us down to 10 life points. To play it safe, I opted to use Candy Trail to crack it to gain some life, and thanks to that, I found a chromatic star that will help us in case we need to use the Glamour on their turn. After casting off one mine, they finally found an Aldat Glitters and decided to use it on their Inspector, attacking for little. I attempted to use the Glamour on it, but this was countered, leading to game number 3. In this hand, on the play, Things were looking great, thanks to crop rotation, I had access to Natural Throne. Feeling somewhat greedy, I used our only the Glamour on their land to disrupt their mana and pass the turn. 
An angry ginger brute came out seeking vengeance. As planned, I summoned a golem with the assistance of crop rotation to find our third throne land and pass the turn. The game began to get tricky as my opponent found an alert glitters, immediately threatening our life totals. In addition to dealing some serious damage, they managed to eliminate our only creature with revoked existence. Finally, we found our forest, we needed to deal with the ornithopter. However, this turned into a top decking battle as a second all that glitters transformed the ginger brute into an unblockable threat that will be difficult to deal with. But in true Yu Gi Oh fashion, I drew our tear the glamour, eliminating the threat. Luck appeared to be on our side as they only play a land and passed. On our turn, I was ready to summon a Fangry Marauder, but it meant a counter spell. So we chose to play a Candy Trail and finish the turn. A mighty frog might join the party, but after playing an Alamo Crusher, they saw the writing on the wall and I secured the victory in this match.